Uh, so hi and welcome to the outmarket.pro podcast i'm your host mark stein and i'm joined today by my returning guest charles malka uh, he's a professor of management at Southern University uh, office of, let me get back to my notes here, um, College of Business and Technology. So we're going to talk about some of the long-term trends that started during COVID and are just now coming into focus uh, as longer-term trends. So welcome back, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So um, what are what are some of the let's just jump right in. What are some of the trends that started during COVID? And you know what? Maybe they may have even started before COVID. One of the things that I've noticed is that COVID seemed to accelerate a lot of trends that were already happening. There's some, I think, that are unique to COVID. But some of those things, for example, the use of uh, video conferencing, like the tools that we're on now, that was going on, but man, did it explode and accelerate during COVID. So uh, let's just start with, with one that's top of mind for you. Well, first, let me just, just uh, in, in terms of background, if, if I may just regress sure. a little bit. Um, as you mentioned, we are writing a new book. Uh, the new book has hands and legs tied up in this way or another to the pandemic. We, we, just, we just cannot ignore that event. It is a major, major um, historical, you know, in terms of magnitude, event that created uh, ha havoc, literally a lot of disruptions. Uh, some of them we saw, some of them we did not foresee. So... When we wrote our first book, Back to a New Normal, uh, we focused on the, on the here and now, so to speak. We did not imagine, because we did not knew, know at the time, uh, some of the ramifications of, of, these, of, the, of the pandemic as we know it now. So our second book, uh, and as you mentioned, the, uh, we titled it Amplifying uh, Management Research uh, for the Common Good. Um, lessons for curious individuals and organizations, and it is basically based on insights of practitioners in different fields, um, you know, to it. And it, in a nutshell, what the book is all about is this. There is a dilemma that people are not aware of, uh, unless you're in, in the academia. We do research, we publish a lot of papers, these papers are published in journals, in academic journals. And what happened in reality is that unless you're a member of a particular association, you have no access to that information. So uh, what I've done, I took a collection of about 16 or 17 uh, of our studies of our research in different areas, very eclectic, uh, and made them available in the book as an appendix, the reader. Then we, we, we align one study or two with a particular practitioners, depends on the field of expertise and the line of work that they do. What we ask them to do is, here is a study that was published in a particular journal you probably never heard about it. You probably never had access to it. Well, take it, define a few themes that you can build based on your experience, a chapter around it. Break it down to the nuts and bolts so that people can understand. They, we don't want any academia-driven paper, research loaded with numbers. We want you to break it down, take the meat out of it, and then build something that is that makes sense to you because of your line of work that will make also sense to people out there. That's what we did. So we produced 10 chapters like that. The chapters are in the very part, the first part of the book. And the second one, we are making now to the interested people 
the studies as they were written, as they were published in journals, that I know for a fact very few have access to it. Even if you are an acad in the academia, unless you are a member of that association, you yourself will have no access to them. And what is, has been happening lately, because I also am an editor of a journal, Journal of Conflict Management, is that many universities don't want to deal with the headache of a journal, managing the logistic side of it. What most universities do, they now uh, outsource everything that has to do with the production of that journal to a publisher, a for-profit publisher. So the publisher will publish an article of yours, but for you to access it, you have to pay it, it ranges, it depends. It can be $50, it can be $100 or more just to have the permission to download a 20 page research paper. To me, it makes very little sense because what I believe in coming from the business to the academia uh, is that studies and findings have to be available for everybody out there. Uh, we don't have to charge for it. Uh, if if you're a curious reader, you should have access and you should read them for fun. If you're an organization or a manager, you should have access to it and read them for a purpose. What can I take and apply to embedder the operations of my business? So that is a little, you know, uh, background, so to speak, information. So to go back to your question, um, chapter two, chapter two in our book is exactly the way you phrased it. Uh, and that is long-term trends that were created anew or accelerated by the pandemic. And that chapter is available to anybody who listens, Mark, to your, uh, to this podcast. Yes. All my papers are available to anybody that is interested in. The best way to access them is to go to Google, Google Scholar. Just enter Google Scholar and then go to the search field and enter my name. And my name should be Shalom, S-H-A-L-O-M, Charles Malka, M-A-L-K-A. If you Google that and you hit the the send key search, a lot of my papers will, will pop up. And it is very likely that this very topic we are talking about of the long trend, uh, long term trends of the pandemic will be the very first to pop up because they are, you know, by it's a recent, so it should be at the top of the list. And, and, and we'll be sure people. we'll be sure to put a link to that in oh, the show notes. Yes, yes. Um, if anybody anybody is interested in 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 a in a particular paper, feel free to email me. You can email me at s like in Sam s Malka, just one word s Malka at Sullivan s u l l i v a n dot e d u, and in my response to you in my email, there is a link at the bottom of all my emails. And that link, if you click on it, will give you direct access to all of my published papers. Well, many of them, not all of them, but the, the more recent ones, including this particular one that we are just talking about. So to your question, my goodness, I, in that chapter, identify 20, believe it or not, 20 long-term <laughs> trends. And we build them this way. We, 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 did, we did a group of them under the heading of uh, labor shortage. We all know how acute is labor shortages today, whether it is your doctor's office or the grocery store, <laughs> or I tried to reach Verizon on the phone about an hour or so ago, and they put me on hold, and then they came and they apologized. They're shorthanded. So short, labor shortages is felt. It is triggered primarily by the pandemic, but something that we call the uh, great resignation. Uh, 
one morning within a, a, a period of eight months, uh, about 12 million Americans left their jobs and walked away. Many of them are coming back to the labor market, different jobs, maybe the old one, if they are allowed to. Uh, we still suffer a great deal from shortages anywhere, in airports, in the grocery stores, in restaurants. Uh, it is very, very, everybody can feel it. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, ultimately, something will happen, and there will, there will be, again, a balance between the supply and demand. But right now, uh, the demand is through the roof and the supply is out there uh, and, and it creates havoc in the labor market, particularly the pressure. Um, for some, it is good pressure on the wages, uh, pushing them up. So let me, let me jump it, in with a question at this point. Sure. Um, that I, I still cannot figure out. There were a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic, let's just say, um, who needed, absolutely needed full-time work, um, not gig work, not driving uh, for Uber or Uber Eats or something. They needed full-time work. And then for various reasons, they stopped during COVID, but many of them, who still need full-time work are not going back to work. And some of those people are not doing gig sorts of uh, uh, labor. How, how, do, how are people getting by when they desperately need this income? I, and I don't know people personally, but I'm aware that, that is some, that's a phenomenon that, that is happening. What are people doing? They are eating into their savings. Uh, the fact that the country was on hold, so to speak, and the economy came to a stop. Uh, people spend less money. They were able to, to, to uh, save more. Uh, and many of them live literally on their savings. And, you know, when you exhaust them or you get to a point, a red line, then you start looking again at the job. But the interesting thing here is, and this is the deep implication, at least for management, to the way companies are operating and continue to operate, it's a wake up call. Surveys are telling us that roughly 42, four out of 10 people that came back to work in a different line of work with a different employer uh, is extremely not happy uh, with the current situation, with their employment. Something has to change within the workplace because business cannot continue as it was pre-pandemic. Uh, management has to step up to the plate, you know, and make changes to make the workplace more attractive, more uh, employee-centered. Uh, revisit in, in uh, another paper of mine, I suggested to revisit the contract between employee and employer. You know, new expectations have, have to be set, set up and so on and so forth. Uh, the management skills, competencies that are required today, post-pandemic, if we can even say so, because people still die from the pandemic, has to be completely diff different than the mindset before. Uh, you all heard about Peter Drucker, you know, uh, passed away a few years ago. He has a very, very uh, cutting edge uh, institution that does a lot of surveys in the best ran companies in America. They have a list of hundreds of companies like that with thousands of C-suite, top, top echelon management. And they learn a great deal about what happened before, what was required, and what happens now, and what is required. The ability to manage ambiguity was never an, a key issue. The ability to have a global view of things was never a big issue before the pandemic. But with the supply chain problems that the companies found themselves in, 
you've got to see outside. You've got to have a global view of what is happening around to prepare for that, because we all know that it's just a matter of time before another pandemic will hit us. Hopefully, and that was our message in our first book, hopefully we're prepared, better prepared for, for it. So labor shortages is a very, very, very real issue and real problem. And Mark, you know, they, there are other things that exacerbate that. A great resignation happened, happened in 2021 uh, and well into the early part of 22. As I said, the total is about 12 million. And every month since then, there are roughly about 11 million non-farm positions that are not filled. Every month, this is the the Office of Labor Statistics. Okay, so it's a big hole that needs to be filled in, and everybody is 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 filling the crunch. But there, there are a lot of good things that happen because of that. As I said, wages are going up. Uh, another thing is a transition of power, bargaining power, from management to the employee out there. You know, empl employees have a lot of power now because of that. We need you. So we're willing, we are forced, we are compelled to work with you. Um, there yeah. are other. Yes. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Uh, to, to go back to something you talked about, the social contract for work. Uh, let's, let's talk about that for a moment and then, and then move on to other things. But so pre, I I came into the workforce in the late 70s, early 80s. And prior to that, I, I came in with a change of the, of the social contract. Prior to that, let's say post-World War II, up to around that point, um, the contract was employees trade your loyalty for security. If you stay with us and give us your best, which is pretty good. Um, you're not going to have to work really hard. You're going to work 40 hours, unless you're in a law firm at the beginning of a law firm. You're going to work hard. You're going to retire with a traditional pension, and you're going to get a gold watch and all of our gratitude. Um, when I came into the workforce, that contract was broken and what emerged and it took a while for this to emerge i think and i want to test this out test my theory out with you is and and it it went into even the millennial the millennials going to the workforce is we're going to give you we're not going to give you security you're going to get uh maybe some contribution into a 401k that you own and that's portable, maybe not, maybe it's just you will we'll provide you the framework. So you're not going to get and you're not going to have any job security beyond when you're needed. And the the trade off for that is we're going to give you opportunities to learn new skills. We may even pay for some training if you use that with us. but you're trading a your your labor at the moment for an opportunity for professional growth that you could take to your next job because nobody expects you to retire from here. Um, am I accurate with defining those two? There may be some others, and if so, what is the new contract going to be, or what is it? What's emerging? Absolutely. The old one was centered around the employer. Company comes first and we demand total, uh, dedication, final work. And in return, you know, we give you, we pay you, we try to pay to give you increases. We'll, we'll do the annual valuation. We'll go through all the ceremony uh, that, that you talked about, which is correct. And the expectation was 
that you're going to be working at your desk until you retire. And as you said, you know, the big watch and what have you, General Electric. That was, that was basically the philosophy of General Electric. Uh, you get a gold watch when you retire. We give you a certificate. We do a little party for it. This is all a relic of the past. It doesn't exist anymore. People are loyal to themselves. They are loyal to the profession, not to the employer or the place of work. The best proof for that was the pandemic. All in a sudden, you got millions of people that kiss their employer, their company. Is goodbye. There is no loyalty. You come first. Your family comes first. You try to max to get the best benefit possible. And, you know, if there is a problem, there is a problem. Uh, I jump ship. I don't want to sink with that particular company or, or, or employer. You are absolutely correct. And because of that, because of that, one of the changes that a pandemic introduced is the whole institution of HR, of human resources. Human resources was always considered a secondary function, a backroom function. It is paperwork driven, it's administrative functions. It never had a strategic role around the table, the decision-making table of companies until the big resignation, hit, the great resignation hit. Companies are starving for employees, they cannot find them fast enough. And what happened, not only the power, bargaining power, you know, in transition from employers to the employee now, an employee has to be pay closer attention to, to what the employ, employee is expecting and what they want. But HR now is a major, major player because they are responsible for the retooling, for the retraining, for the hiring. And mind you, you know it well, all in a sudden you cannot even interview people in person. You use technology, you use Zoom to interview people out there. Gone are the days that the machine picks applications and we are based who we are gonna invite for an interview on, on some keywords. Today you're starring for anybody so much that here is another long-term trend is what, what I called here a new color. It's not anymore a blue color or white color because companies are reducing the qualifications for acceptance for the, the hiring criteria have changed because you're so starving for employees. People get promotions. People are doing jobs. If they stayed with a company that, in regular times, they would have never dreamed. Mm. So there was a, a, a kick up, okay? Not out, but up. People now have new titles, uh, different pay structure. You know, talking about pay, here is another thing, as, as you're aware of, is all in a sudden companies are required to publish their, their ongoing pay rates. This never happened before. You got states like California and Washington and Oregon and some cities like New York City where employees are publishing, uh, you know, their rates, their pay rate and employer are required to do so. This by itself is another indication on the transition of power for employee, for, from employer to the employee. So, I mean, all these dynamics are out there that are telling us that the work today, the office today, the workplace of today, the contract, as you alluded to, has absolutely to be revised, has to be revisited and adjusted to meet the new dynamics at the workplace that are happen happening. But what, so what needs to happen in order to accommodate this? Is it? ping pong tables and i mean during the during the tech boom it was free meals dry cleaning uh daycare on site um all sorts of perks i don't think that does it anymore either right no i mean I, employers are offering that cafeteria of benefits you're absolutely right but it it it, it has to be 
personalized. You know, it has to be tied to the expectation tailored to the individual. It's not something across the board anymore. You know, it's it just it, it doesn't work anymore. You have to tailor it to the skills, to the to the the, the know-how, uh, to the competencies of of an employee. It has to be more like that. But you also cannot cook things behind closed doors because more and more states and cities are adopting the new policy, the new approach that you have to publish for everybody to see, you know, your pay rate. What do you pay for a particular job or a particular role? It cannot be in closed doors anymore. It has to be wide open. So what is happening is is uh, a mix of conflicting things that I you, you you expect to tailor something to me to my background my education my ex years of work and so on and so forth my competencies that I bring to the table but at the same time you have to publish to the public to know and see my our company this uh, this is the the the, the uh, pay rate that we have for a particular job. A lot of that conflict is happening. And again, how management is handling this is going to be a key that will determine the viability of company X or company Y. There is so much turmoil and so much pressure going on that is un unbelievable. Work from home is, is an area that reflected more than anything else. Because employers tended to force everybody across the board to come back to the office. Well, because the power is now moving more and more to the employee, em employees thought there was a strong pushback. And then somehow it settled somewhere in the middle. Okay, you can work from home four days, but you have to come to the office a day or two or vice versa, whatever it is. So that hybrid model that never existed before in the magnitude that it is now is forcing forcing you know um a pushback to 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 companies uh, uh, general motors is a good example where they wanted everybody white collar blue collar definitely to come back to work there was a strong pushback from the unions and they settled on some sort of a hybrid that management with each employee will determine what works or both. Ultimately, there will be a balance between worker expectations and company needs, you know, in a form of, of uh, a hybrid approach of some sort. That's, mm -hmm. that's what's happening right now as we speak. Elon had an interesting take on it. He said, you can work at, as, at home as much as you want after you've put 40 hours in at the office and the office <laughs> <laughs> you know well he he is quite something an entrepreneur with a very creative mind and uh but here here, here is one thing that is happening also that i i want to mention if, even even just by by name so to speak and that is ai and robotics because of the shortages of employees more companies are adopting uh automation and automation supposed to solve some of the issues and some of the problems of not finding a lot of bodies around the assembly line so it happens everywhere the more i read about it the more astonished i am that it used to be automation in the automotive business not anymore i mean in the old days automation uh, got a big kick within the automotive industry. Car makers, automobile makers use a lot of automation, as we know, um, for efficiency purposes, cutting costs primarily. Uh, machine is not moody, uh, doesn't take days off, doesn't get sick, and so on and so forth. So it, it was understandable. The pandemic created these shortages in labor, and as a result, companies, large and small, are heavily into automation. And part of it is because of the shortages of labor created by the pandemic. Um, so I, I mentioned banking, 
is one 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 way one way to look at it but also the fast food this is unbelievable fast food as you know is labor intensive and this is the bottom of the bottom in terms of entry level you know for employees they got clobbered they got clobbered by by shortage by re, re, you know resignations turnover and what have you and uh um, I mean, McDonald's is experimenting right now with almost a fully automated order system uh, for fast food. And basically, they eliminated, in some of the models that they're experimenting with, they eliminated all the front uh, desk, so to speak, employees within a little uh, place. And uh, it just you have two guys in the back that are reading the orders and preparing the food. And even even getting it out is done through, uh, you know, uh, convertible, you know. Uh, so everything is automated. They're experimenting with it. Starbucks is looking heavy in, into it. I mean, think about it. It solves so many, many problems for them of scheduling and unexpected, you know, no show ups and turnover. I mean, machine does all of this 24-7. Uh, why not do it? Nobody want to admit it because it's going to cost uh, jobs. But think about the good thing that can come out of it is it's the upskilling, forcing people to go back to school, to get training, to learn new skills, whatever they are, so that you will not be easily replaced. Or if you move, you move up rather than out into a new role, into a new position, and what have you. So th this, this is what's happening in the workplace today. And I think even if it started earlier, as you said earlier, you know, before the pandemic, it, it is more clearly, clearly we see the direction where things are moving uh, and got a boost because of the pandemic. Bad or good, it doesn't matter. It is a real trend that is happening, automation. And I mentioned my, my chapter in the book and my articles in, in the site that I mentioned earlier, I provide a lot of statistics in support of each one of the 20 trends, uh, trends long-term trends that, I, that, that are listed. So we're just not making things up in the air. They are anchored into real statistics, into real numbers, and anybody can look into it, go to the references we are using, have a better access to a specific aspect of these than what we can cover, you know, in, in, in a 40 minute conversation. Let me ask you this as far as, far as a possible solution. And let, let me point back to Elon um, <clears throat> as an example with um, Tesla, not we'll, we'll ignore SpaceX for a moment. So at Tesla, the management layers are very flat. <clears throat> And they empower employees and teams to make changes. Uh, they, they are coordinated, but make changes and give them the authority to make those changes and make them very fast. They're also giving them access to stock and stock options to get them ownership in the process. So here is here are two prongs control of of the work environment and their work environment and a lot of them can work across departments they can they can move into an area that they're interested in working in some of them don't even have to ask permission so in financial incentives and buy-in uh, and ownership with control let me and i'm experimenting with some of this too um, and a lot of this is sort of been intuitive, but let me just let me check it out as a possible solution. Giving giving people more say in how they do their job. Um, focusing on teamwork and collaboration. Giving opportunities to focus on excellence and continuous improvement so that they're, they don't ever reach a plateau 
if we're if we're pushing to always make our processes more efficient uh take labor out um still shuffling the labor into into other tasks but also giving a sense of a clearer sense of purpose and participation in something greater than any of us <clears throat> individually so maybe a, a greater sense of purpose and joint mission to feel more a part of it <clears throat> is is that part of the solution for today's uh, worker yeah i couldn't put it in better terms that is a magnificent way to conceptualize happening absolutely you know if you go back to the some of the old theories in management particularly in the field of motivation there is every job has extrinsic and, and intrinsic aspects the ex extrinsic is everything that happens around it is working conditions it's the wage wages uh, mm -hmm. level of, of pay and uh, other conditions and terms the intrinsic parts is everything that you as a human being derive from your job in terms of responsibility <clears throat> satisfaction um uh, you know uh decision making ability less control freedom to think and experiment i mean the and, and what is happening is uh is that that uh, many companies overemphasize the extrinsic side of the job at the expense of what a person as a human being can derive the pleasure of doing the pleasure of working the, the pleasure of having the freedom to make the decisions to make the corrections you know without being told by hierarchy above you that by itself brought many companies to a flat structure and you mentioned elon musk you know tesla absolutely a teamwork rather than a hierarchy of God only knows how many levels above you. Every level creates more bureaucracy, creates more paperwork, uh, uh, coordination challenges, communication problems. Of course, you know, and in today's world, when you have to act and react fast, any company that has these old approaches will go belly up in a matter of time. So, what you said is exactly the line of work that needs to guide management in today's office when i say office company absolutely and this is why 42 percent of people that resigned their job during the pandemic and found a new job say and state that they are not happy in their new place in their new office okay because they're exactly bound, they're they're yes. in these silos uh, uh, either that or again companies think that if i pay a, a few extra dollars compared to the other guy down the street i'll be able to retain these employees and it's proven that this approach is is uh his part of history not modern way because people are looking for more than just a paycheck they they gain a lot and this this is exactly what you said links us to the very start of, of this conversation about being loyal to your profession, your discipline, not to the company physically, to the to the employer I'm working with. Uh, technology people, you know, IT people are the best example. They are loyal to, to their job. They are loyal to their discipline, uh, not to the company X or company Y. Uh, and because of that, they have long wings. You know, if if I'm not happy doing what I'm supposed to do here, I will go down the street to another company and and do it, because they appreciate me. They give me the freedom. They allow me to experiment. They don't punish me if I made a mistake. They use an error as a learning tool. So you see, this is it. I mean, I mean, uh, Mark, you define it in an excellent way and that is exactly what is happening and this is what i refer to a new contract between employer and employee is exact make the, the job make the place more meaningful to employees don't think that by adding them a few hundred dollars you know per year 
you're going to retain it and keep them for a good. That is important, but that's a baseline. They want much more than that. And if your job does not provide that, if the environment of your company, if the culture of your company does not give them that meaningful, that intrinsic aspect of, of the job, they're not going to stay with you. Uh, you you talked about two other things that I think may be key. One of them is about making mistakes. Um, now, some of the tech companies say, encourage people, you know, let's break things. Let's, you know, so encouraging people to do it. Um, I, I think another maybe in between approach is let's let's acknowledge that we're going to make mistakes, <clears throat> but let's fix the ones that we made. And let's try to always make new mistakes, not not the same ones. And then on the pushing forward, what about always working to create new new services, new products, so that they're they're excited about seeing new things, doing new processes, building to be crass about it, building cool shit for for our customers. And then finally, let's stay focused on our customers, making them happy, making them whole, and let's all put our best effort and focus our energies on serving them the best way we can. That, Are those absolutely. also part of this puzzle? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. At 3M, everybody heard about 3M, right? Minnesota-based, uh, huge company, a lot of things. That's the at least the old uh, 3M. You know that was the philosophy of innovation, of being uh, innovative, uh, giving their 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 uh, people the freedom, x number of hours, think about new projects, and we pay you whether you are in the office or at home, in your garage, experimenting with you know innovation, powerful, 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 uh, you know force that propelled them to excel, making 3M what, it, what, what they've been for many, many years. Unfortunately, you know, with new CEO, new change in strategy, uh, they moved away from uh, the experimentation uh, side to formalizing their processes and, and focusing on exploitation rather than uh, exploration, so to speak. Uh, and, and, and that forced them to focus on uh, process management, all kind of new techniques, you know, of of uh, controlling mistakes and re reducing error, rate of errors and what have you. And when a company focuses too much on the exploitation of data, of knowledge, of know-how, rather than also do exploration, creating new ideas, new innovative products, making mistakes because you learn from them. Yes. As a matter of policy, uh, you move away and you lose for the long term. And that's what happened to 3M. I really hope that they will change direction and get that trajectory of continuing to be a very innovative company rather than be bogged down in process management. Um, Six Sigmas and all this stuff that you probably know about them. All these, they are important. But if you overemphasize them, you take the life out of the ex ex exploration part. And that tension between exploitation and exploration is very, very important. By the way, one of my early papers dealt with the, conflict, with the tension between and how to resolve it. And again, I invite if anybody in, uh, uh, that is watching here is interested, they probably can find that paper somewhere there in the site provided. So, this is fascinating stuff, and obviously you're on top of it, and you see things uh, in 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 the proper way. And I I really hope that whoever is listening, if they are interested in that, they can dig deeply into it. But uh, all these dynamics are part of life, uh, part of of companies, part of management today. Uh, and, and you know, if if there is any message that we can convey to, is to pay close attention to them. Uh, rather than ignore them and, and hope that, uh, you know, uh, employees will continue to be on work for us for years to come. That is long gone. <clears throat> Great. Well, we could, 
I can already tell we could talk for hours about some of this because we haven't even gotten into the ramifications of AI, chat GPT, robotics with uh, Tesla planning to roll out a robot within the next, a, a working model within the next year or so. So let's do plan to, to talk again, but uh, as we wrap up here, give us ways to, to contact you again, and we'll put those in the show notes. Best ways to reach you, um, give email, I, yeah. phone, uh, yeah, email, web. E e email definitely will be the easy and uh, the best way. I'm, I'm certainly, and I'm good at responding uh, to any email I, I, I get. You know, that's just a philosophy of mine. Coming no shortage of labor world. on your email, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, S, like in Sam, S Malka, just one word, S Malka, S M A L K A, at Sullivan, S U L L I V A N, dot com. Uh, in my dot com, not dot edu. Uh, dot I'm com. sorry, dot edu. I apologize. Dot edu. Okay. Oh, what did I say? Oh, definitely. S Malka at Sullivan dot edu. Uh, and in my response to you, there will be a, a website at the bottom under my credentials. Uh, if you click on it, you'll have access to some of my uh, more recent papers, uh, books. And, um, uh, you know, if you're interested in books, you can, uh, again, Google the, the name and you will see it on uh, Amazon.com. Um, and I'll gladly address or answer, you know, any questions that you may have or clarification, I will gladly uh, uh, address. Great. And anybody with Shalom as a first name, we need to schedule another podcast to talk about peacemaking. And I understood that you, you're you involved with conflict resolution and conflict management. So let's yes. definitely plan to do that as well. Super. I'll gladly do so. Thank you. So, uh, Charles, thanks again for joining us on another podcast episode of Outmarket.pro's podcast. To learn more about Charles, check out his information down below in the show notes um, and the references that he gave during the podcast. If you enjoy the episode, please check out other interviews on our channel. And don't forget to like and subscribe and click the notification button so that you'll find out about more episodes of the Outmarket.pro podcast. Thanks a lot. Thanks again, Charles, and we'll see you next time.